Welcome everybody. I'm so excited to be able to share these results with you from last year's student textbook affordability survey. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm recording this presentation to make it available to other Skidmore folks. I'd like this to be the start of a conversation, not just, you know, here's the results and then we're done. So uh, let me get started. There we go. All right, so a year ago, we administered a survey here on campus with three research questions in mind. We wanted to know first how much money students are spending on their course materials, primarily textbooks. Uh, where for the purposes of this survey, we weren't interested in art materials or other like science lab supplies and so on. That could be for another, sur uh, another survey or another study. Uh, we wanted to know what strategies students use to reduce those costs, and then we wanted to know how they're affected by those costs. So these are the particip participating schools, uh, as well as the librarians who spearheaded the project at each of their institutions. And uh, these are all schools who are part of the Oberlin Group, which is a consortium of 84 liberal arts college libraries. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to Emily Calloway, who graduated last year, and Chloe Lewis, who's a senior this year, who both helped me out with local survey planning and implementation. They had both taken my Bridge Experience course a couple of years ago and expressed interest in this topic, so um, they were eager to help out. So here you can see the methodology developed by the project leads from Bates College. The nine survey questions were adapted from two previous surveys, one in 2016, the Florida Virtual Campus Survey, and the 2019 Gettysburg College Survey. We also asked eight demographic questions in order to figure out if the response group represented the entire student body and if the cost of textbooks affects some student groups differently than others. Uh, Bates College coordinated the survey data collection and analysis. We didn't do a random sampling, but rather encouraged all of our students to take the survey. And as an aggregate, there were 3,601 responses, providing an average response rate of 15% for participating institutions. That's not a great response rate. Um, our institution helped to drag down that response rate, unfortunately. Um, we had a response rate of 5%. So, uh, I, I'm hoping that we use these results as a jumping off point for further, further exploration here on campus. Um, but in this presentation, I will mostly be reporting the results of the aggregated group, but I'll give you a sense of Skidmore results where they um, differed from the group significantly. So here's the first question. We asked students how much book costs uh, were for them for their fall 2022 courses, which they would have just purchased when they filled out the survey or not purchased, as we'll see. So the average cost for all respondents was $239.18. And the most common response was 200. So for comparison, uh, there's a 2022 report from the College Board called Trends in College Pricing and Student Aid. And that report indicates that students at institutions similar to ours, private nonprofit four-year residential colleges, spend on average $340 per year on course materials. So if you double our one semester estimate of 200, it's roughly in the same ballpark we may be paying more. So cost differed significantly by class year with first year spending the most and seniors spending the least. And you may have your own personal theories about why this pattern would emerge. Um, it, for those of us who were working on this survey, we think this supports the idea that first year students don't yet have the knowledge of what resources they have on hand at the institution or the measures that they can take to reduce their costs. It may be that they feel some pressure internally or externally uh, to do the right thing and buy everything that you're told to do at the first start of the year of your first year. 
Um, but it may also be that introductory courses have higher textbook costs. We, we don't have that information, but it's worth thinking about. We were especially interested in how book costs affected first-generation students and Pell Grant recipients. So you'll see those results highlighted throughout this presentation. For the average cost of fall textbooks, the averages varied significantly for both groups, as you can see here. So for first-generation students, uh, they spent nearly $100 more on average than non-first-gen students. And then for Pell Grant recipients, they spent an average of $26 more than non-Pell students. Skidmore's results were similar, maybe a little narrower. So I'll be closing each section of this presentation with real comments from uh, Skidmore survey respondents. Each question had opportunities to provide comments. Uh, the student said, I needed to put in extra hours of work to afford my textbooks. All right, so here's the next question. We asked students to provide us with a number they think is reasonable to pay for a single class. So we might think of this as a question about what's affordable. So $50 was the most common response. The average for all respondents was $62.37, and it didn't vary significantly by class year. So clearly most students think it's reasonable to pay something for their textbooks or their course materials, but just not a large amount. And again, we looked at what the first gen and Pell Grant students thought was a reasonable cost for a single class. And the average response varied significantly among both groups. So as you can see, first gen students their perception of what books should reasonably cost is higher than non-first-gen students, similar for Pell Grant students. So, uh, and for Skidmore, it, the gap was a little narrower, but uh, similar. So we've learned that first-gen students and Pell students pay more for books and also named a higher reasonable per class book cost than non-first-gen and non-Pell students. And we found this a little bit surprising, but uh, perhaps the explanation lies in students differing understandings or attitudes toward the value of a college education. And again, this would be something for us to explore more on our campus here. So this student said, I can purchase what materials I need as long as the textbooks aren't multiple hundreds of dollars. However, many of my peers who pay for their own supplies absolutely cannot afford it. And we received a number of open-ended comments reiterating this point. For every Skidmore student whose family can afford the cost of course materials, there are classmates who do not have the same resources and arguably therefore don't have the same access to their Skidmore education. So the next question sought to understand the range of actions that students take when it's time to get their required books. And you might not be able to read this slide very easily. So let me point out a few key items. And then in the next slide, I'll be zeroing in on the top responses and talking about those a little bit more. But starting at the bottom, I'll just use my pointer here. This is where I'm at. I do not attempt to reduce book costs. Only 5.5% of all students said that. What that means is that 95% or so of all students are doing something to lower the costs of their textbooks or their course materials. Uh, I've also added a column here for uh, Skidmore where uh, just to call out a few places where our responses differed significantly by more than 10%. Uh, so buying books from a source other than the campus bookstore uh, was significantly higher for Skidmore. And then uh, renting a copy from the bookstore was significantly lower. And then using a reserve copy from the campus library was significantly lower, which was a knife to my heart. But no, I'm just kidding. Um, there, that's something that we're already trying to think about and work on. Uh, building a better partnership uh, and workflow between the library and the bookstore at the beginning of each semester. 
So to focus in on the top responses to this question, students were most likely to buy books from a source other than the college bookstore and to use books from the college bookstore as a way to control costs. But nearly a third do not purchase all of the required books for a class. So I'm highlighting the other option here. Um, right here, students were given the option to self-report other types of measures used to control costs. And of note, it appears that some form of downloaded from the web or extra legal activities, piracy uh, and so on, uh, were by far the most common response. Okay, so these charts isolate some of the biggest differences in measures taken from our first gen students and Pell Grant students listed in the order of greatest difference. So the pay attention to the right-hand column here. So these students were far more likely to utilize the library to get their course materials and to work additional hours to pay for their books. And again, here's a sampling of comments from Skidmore students about managing their costs, using free online sources, working extra hours, downloading illegally, purchasing from somewhere else to, or somewhere local rather to reduce shipping costs, and then asking somebody else who's already taken the course to use their books. We then asked students to tell us how the cost of required books has impacted them over their entire college career. So remember the earlier questions asked specifically about one semester, the fall semester, um, and this is asking about their entire college career. So the most common impact of the cost of books and materials is that students don't buy all of the required books. So you can see that uh, up here at the top. Um, nearly 29% of respondents indicated that they didn't experience any of the possible response options. That's down here, the none of these. And this may mean that the costs didn't impact them or that they were able to control their costs, but it could also mean that, that of the options listed here, they were impacted in some other way. So it's important to note that 19% of students, let's back up here, struggled academically because they couldn't access the books that they had for a class. And then nearly 20% either dropped a course before the beginning of a semester or, uh, or chose not to register for a specific course because of the cost. And we, finally, we had an option for first years and transfer students to select no effect because it was their first semester in college. And we did this in order to separate out students who are simply not impacted by textbook costs from those who haven't been on campus long enough to feel the effects. And I'll just say that Skidmore numbers were nearly identical to the aggregated results. There is some variation by first generation student status and Pell Grant recipient status. In general, first-generation students are much more likely to be affected by costs than students who are not. So you can see the difference column again on this side. Struggle academically because they couldn't access the books uh, was the top response uh, and had the biggest difference between the two groups. And Skidmore res responses were similar. And again, Skidmore responses to the question of how the cost of textbooks impact them reflect these themes. Put financial strain on my parents means cutting back on other things in my household. I have to use a loan to pay for my books. These are uh, impacts that are going to weigh heavily on some students. So switching gears, the next question asks students which book format they preferred. This question helps us to consider the possible courses of action we might take in order to address the impacts that we just talked about. So students prefer printed books significantly more than all the other options, but half of all respondents also indicated that they prefer whichever is cheaper. 
Now, Skidmore responses were similar with 76% saying that they preferred print, uh, but otherwise they, they were very similar. Now, lest we conclude that we should uh, avoid investing in eBooks, there were plenty of comments uh, that pointed to advantages to digital formats. So this student wrote, if it's a book I might keep, uh, I get a new copy, a presumably print. If it's something I don't care about, I rent an eBook. eBooks are my preferred textbook as I can search them. So searchability is valued. Um, numerous respondents pointed to the ways in which ebooks are more accessible to neurodivergent students or to individuals with disabilities. So we next asked students who pays for their textbooks. And most often a student pays or their family pays. Apparently scholarships and loans aren't a large source of funding for textbooks. Not a lot of students have awards that specifically cover the costs, but when they do, they spend more uh, and Skidmore responses were comparable. So I wanna show you what the average cost per response was. And students who do not pay with their own money um, or they don't have access to their family's money for, for textbooks, they pay on average a lot more than the other students do. So students with a scholarship, for example, pay the highest on average than any other group. Um, and this could be because some scholarships will restrict a student to purchasing their textbooks from the campus bookstore, which maybe um, is usually more expensive. But um, again, this is something that we could investigate further. And as we might expect, the first gen and Pell Grant recipient students are much less likely to have parental or family support for textbook costs. And finally, we asked students whether they thought their individual professors or the institution cared about the cost of course materials and did anything about it. And this was asked in two separate questions, but the responses are visualized in one slide here. So faculty is the lighter color of blue here and institution is the darker color of blue. And this chart shows the total number of survey responses across all 11 campuses. So half of all students agree or strongly agree that their professors pay attention to the cost of course materials and work to make them affordable. A quarter are neutral and another 25% don't agree. On the other hand, and you can see by the, the distribution of the lines here, uh, they don't think that the college or university pays attention to costs with 53% disagreeing or strongly disagreeing with this statement. In short, students are much more critical of their college than of their individual professors. And I wanna show you the contrast now of Skidmore specific responses. Granted, it's a you know fifth five percent of Skidmore, so take that into account. But you can see how the distribution slants more to the bottom. So Skidmore responses were more critical than the aggregated responses. I'll just show you. I'll flip back so you can see. And here's Skidmore. And you can see that the Skidmore responses are far more uh, critical of the institution. So here's one student's response. While I think some professors are very conscious about book costs, mainly younger professors who have recently been in school, I, in my experience, there are more professors that don't seem to make the effort. But there were some shout outs to faculty who are actively taking steps to address the situation. For example, this student named the chemistry department. Uh, they said, Skid Chem is working to move away from making kids buy textbooks by using free online options or scanning the sections necessary. It's a huge stress off my back because having to pay for textbooks means buying less food or other basic needs. So getting towards the end of my presentation here, I wanna uh, boil this down to some key takeaways for you. 
I know it's a lot of information, but the aggregate results suggest the following. First of all, first year students, first generation students and Pell Grant recipients suffer the largest consequences. So students with fewer resources struggle the most. And as students become savvier, the methods that they use to acquire their textbooks expand. So students get better at finding ways to save money, even if that may, means doing something illegal in order to do it. 50% or $50 rather is the cutoff for what students view as affordable or reasonable to pay. And while some individual faculty are addressing book costs, institutional level actions are lacking. So there are some things that we as a community can do to influence textbook affordability environment here on campus. And we're already doing some of these things here at Skidmore, so I'll highlight those with a check mark. So library reserves program for all course required textbooks. I'm putting a check mark, but we're, we're starting to do that more. We have had course reserves for many, many years, but we haven't automatically put things on reserve. Um, we're starting to do that um, working with the Skid Shop, and we can talk a little bit more about this in the Q&A session but we're getting all of the uh, course reserves that the Skid Shop re receives, and we're proactively pulling anything from our collections and um, putting them on reserve before the faculty even request that we do so. Uh, that won't always help with last minute uh, course assignments. That won't always help uh, if we don't own the items, but it's at least a start. Peer-to-peer -peer sharing or student exchanges. We do have a lending library that was started back in uh, 2019, I believe, right before the pandemic. SGA worked with the library to set this up. And I think it's still operational. It lives in Case Center. I popped my head in the other day. Um, so I'm interested in the Q&A to hear how it's going and allowing students to acquire older editions. And the Skid Shop representatives here can speak more directly to this, but when possible, I know that the Skid Shop is interested in acquiring older editions that are cheaper. Now, the next two things that we can do, oops, I forgot to change the order of my um, animation. Uh, the next two are institutional support for faculty and institutional support for at the time of tenure and promotion for faculty. So basically these two items are talking about incentives for faculty to assign free or low cost materials. And this sounds like a no brainer, um, but if you've been teaching a course for a while or you've just developed a new course, you're looking as a faculty member at what content is gonna work for your class, is gonna meet your learning goals for the class. And so it's not an easy thing to just switch gears and be like, oh, well, I'll use that free thing instead. Um, it takes time and effort and therefore providing incentives to faculty will help immensely. And finally, the last item is course marking for free or low cost books. And what this is talking about is in the course catalog, when you're at the point of choosing your courses for an upcoming semester, if there were a labeling system that indicated the relative cost of the course materials for that course, you could make a, a more informed decision about what courses to take. Now, this could be a controversial suggestion. Um, it was suggested by a team from my Bridge Experience course two years ago, um, and they researched the, the problem and or the, the uh, proposal and um, gave examples of campuses that are already doing this. Um, and so it's something that we could consider uh, moving ahead with uh, here at Skidmore if we had uh, buy-in from uh, the rest of campus, including faculty. So we do want to be aware of expecting the textbook publishers to help us out. Um, so commercial publishers are very aware of the cost problem and they are being very creative at trying to look like they are helping us out. But you have to be very wary of their solutions because they're the people who caused the problem. So textbook publishers have embraced the digital format. 
Prices may be lower for students, especially for rentals, but there are a lot of drawbacks to it. Students don't retain access to the content after the licensing period, which can vary a lot. If there's not a print equivalent that a student can grab, uh, in case like they're, they're having computer issues or they can't figure out something with their account for, for accessing that book, then they, they're locked out of that book. Also, digital books can't be resold. Um, thereby depriving students of the, the tiny, <laughs> even the tiny amount of money that you recoup when you sell back a print text. You can't share it with your classmate or a friend who's taking the same class the next semester. Um, so let's not also forget that a majority of our students asked or told us that they actually prefer print. So then there's this uh, program called Inclusive Access, which sounds good because inclusion is something that's desirable these days, but it is more accurately described as an automatic textbook billing program. And in this model, all enrolled students in a course are automatically charged for the textbook uh, and they're billed for it. So you have no choice to say, no, don't bill me for that because I have my roommates taking the same class and we're just gonna share. Or you can't say, um, you know, I, I can't actually afford this textbook, so I'm going to figure it out. Um, so publishers try to tell us that they are lowering the prices for the in these programs, but but it's really an opaque process. And we don't know for sure that the prices are actually lower than what the publishers could offer um, anyway. So um, I don't have a lot of time to get into details with this model, but the link that I'm showing here, the www.inclusiveaccess.org, is a really informational site that um, lays out all of the drawbacks and concerns with this model. So I am going to stop there. I'm, I'm going to stop recording and allow us to uh, have some conversation.